Welcome back to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer, Brandon Jones, and myself, Dan Strafford, here with our 2019 Learning and Education Prediction Show. Brandon, how are you doing today? I'm super. I, I like our prediction show. I liked our prediction show from last year. I tried to sell a, a portmanteau, uh, a, a mashup of a word that didn't really work. Um, we all said kid solving. Uh, that yeah, was good. That was great. Um, yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm excited. And the, the benefit of doing this at the end of February <laughs> is uh, that we can, we can just predict things that have already happened and then be on the record saying we predicted in 2019. That's true. So um, I am, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited. As we often hear, skate to where the puck is going, right, Mike? As Gretzky once said, so if I can skate where the puck has already been, uh, that means I'm winning as well, uh, to Brandon's point about things that have already happened. Uh, Mike, how are you today? What's uh, new in your world? Uh, I'm good. It's a fun time of year. Also, like we've been uh, doing a series of shows about uh, the trends that, uh, that other folks are talking about. And, uh, and I think that's good uh, pre-work uh, for ourselves uh, in terms of uh, – trying to absorb a lot of different inputs. Um, interestingly, I do know uh, Rohit uh, Bargava, a friend of the show, his new trend book uh, for 2019 uh, is now out. And I've, I've been reading through that as well. So I think that's another one for us to, to come back to in the future. But, uh, but yeah, we've, we've really been uh, pouring over a ton of different uh, inputs. And um, I'm curious uh, what we wind up synthesizing. Uh, and then I'm really excited to see how that then uh, can feed our March Madness, which uh, which uh, I know Kid Solving, I believe, won last year's March Madness. I think that's right. So that one, of the, yeah. one of the predictions uh, that, that we uh, put forward in uh, this show a year ago wound up going on and uh, running the table and winning our March Madness tournament. So this, uh, this uh, you know, we're, uh, we got big shoes to fill uh, this year, but fortunately, they're our own more to come on March Madness. We'll have uh, brackets out uh, in March, not surprisingly there. Uh, who wants to go first? Uh, I have a single one. I, I've worked on it. I, I'm, I'm proud of it, but I only have one. I can go first. I can go last. Brandon, Mike. That's who, a pretty good lean, and I think you should go first, Dan. Yeah. So I believe 2019, we will see a new MA in education, M&A, mergers and acquisitions for small and rural universities throughout the country. Uh, so you all know Masters of Arts in a grad school setting. I think we're going to see mergers and acquisitions take over a lot of small schools. We already start to see them here in Massachusetts uh, where campuses are just shuttering and selling off their assets, even selling off their student rosters. So I think we're going to see an increase uh, and uh, a speed up on that uh, throughout 2019 as small colleges struggle uh, to keep paying the bills uh, in 2019. I like that. So the, you're saying the new MA, right. you're making a, a master's degree and M&A joke. Correct. Right. They, they, Correct. We, like, we need to sell that one along with like a translation of that, of that Dan Strafford. <laughs> That's fair. I fair. think that trend is, is real also. Um, you know, we've, we've talked on this pod in the past about the education, higher education bubble. Um, you know, most schools, I would argue, are probably raising – tuition because their costs are increasing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you could argue about the um, rational uh, and rationale, how rational and what the rationale is for that cost structure. But uh, it is, it's hard out there for a, a small liberal arts or rural college. And so these um, sort of um, consolidation in that space, I think is, is, is probably going to happen. Who I, would, I, I, I flash feedback, Dan. I, I like that trend. I appreciate it. I think we may also see uh, some sharing of online resources, not necessarily a merger, but the sort of sharing teachers across different schools, uh, trying to get more students online. But I think specifically we are going to see an uptick in mergers and acquisitions in higher ed. Uh, Brandon, would you like to go next? Sure. I have two. Mike, how do you want to do this? Do you want to do, you want to do one and one and one and one? Sure. Uh, do you want yeah. to go two and two? Uh... Let's go one-on-one. -on -one. Let's go right. back and forth. Back and forth. Okay. My first prediction for 2019 is Education 2020. Mm. So uh, in uh, this is a presidential election year that we're heading into in 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, education and, um, sorry, the, the presidential uh, sort of, uh, movement of people um, throwing their hat in the ring and starting to even run ad campaigns early presidential activity is going to start uh, in earnest in 2019. And I think that ed candidates uh, will put education on the ballot 
in terms of um, what their platform is. And there's on both sides. So um, there are things that are in the milieu that uh, today that were not so much four years ago or even two years ago, uh, I guess last year officially. Um, but in terms of having a, uh, you know, ha having the, the opportunity in a presidential run to talk about education, it's going to put it back in the social sort of conscious. And mm -hmm. so things like um, uh, charter schools and the place of charter schools, mm -hmm. it's a divisive issue. Uh, things like um, teacher unions uh, and the impact of teacher strikes. Um, this is going to be something that we talk about. Now, we talked about last time about legislation being introduced. I'm not so bullish on that. I actually think this is going to be more rhetorical. Mm -hmm. But I think that whenever education gets to be in the headlines, there are both national and then even probably more importantly, um, state and local implications of that. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I'm saying running for president in 2020 is education, mm -hmm. education 2020. Nice. And is there a 2020 vision? You know, like to how, how clearly can we see our way into next year and all the way through it to the point that we're actually affecting some change. Cause I, I think the risk to your point is that it's more rhetorical. Uh, it's more focus grouped and sound bitten, uh, but it's not really uh, uh, practical to the point that it's actually gonna impact uh, the students and the educators who are sort of struggling with the day-to-day -day, uh, complexities of, of teaching. Um, uh, I'd be curious, like, you know, you mentioned charter schools and you mentioned uh, a couple other areas. Are there any um, particular, um, like, hot button items that you think will be out there that'll, like, flashpoints perhaps that might make education uh, more, uh, more top of mind? Yeah. So uh, you asked a couple questions there. The first one, I, I'm still, I'm not actually, and this is maybe just cynicism, but I'm not super bullish on the rhetoric turning into action. So, Check back with us uh, in predictions 2020 or 2021. Yeah, just to be clear, uh, uh, that was a rhetorical question. Yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um, so uh, nicely done. Um, yeah, I think there's going to be a referendum on Betsy DeVos. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's going to be something that that people are stumping about. I think um, you know one party has the obligation, I think, to make a platform about something other than just not the other party, mm -hmm. right? So I think that um, people who are you know. Democrats who are just uh, sort of stumping on anti-Trump message mm -hmm. messages, I think that's not going to actually be enough. That's not enough substance to be able to get to make them electable. So they're going to need to find um, issues. And, and education obviously isn't the only issue, and it may not be the biggest issue, but there's enough people with enough various viewpoints uh, already in the field um, and with some different records um, on, uh, on, on education that I think it's going to be something that that is uh, is talked about. So charter schools, uh, teacher um, uh, teacher labor and labor unions. Uh, there was a poll in one of the articles we read last week. There was a poll that talked about seven, 73 percent of Americans would be supportive of higher teacher salaries. Mm -hmm. uh, there's very few things that 73 percent of Americans agree on these days. Right. Uh, now I don't know how representative that sample was, and and I don't know if you know, if it were presented as you could have that or, um, you know, or, or nothing mm -hmm. uh, versus that or, you know, some other delight. Um, so, but it's, uh, I, I think those, those particular sets of issues, Betsy DeVos, charter schools and um, teacher strikes are going to all be part of what's in the conversation outside of just the typical education space where it already is. That makes sense. Um... Maybe to pick up on that, uh, one of my predictions, uh, which again is a little bit of a callback, is uh, the whole teacher movement. Uh, so that rather than uh, just looking at the whole child, let's look at the whole teacher. Uh, and that is interesting, even if you think about the State of the Union, uh, which we just uh, either saw or avoided recently. Um, there are a lot of examples uh, where you wanna sort of humanize and personify uh, the points that you're trying to make. Uh, I think increasingly we're going to see the, the teacher as uh, front and center uh, in terms of the narrative around education. Uh, and I think it's going to be um, a, a bit of a sad uh, narrative, at least to begin with, that like we're not really providing the full set of uh, uh, support 
uh, and tooling for teachers to allow them to really succeed in their jobs. Um, I think that narrative is going to, um, you know, get get more uh, attention over the course of the year. We did get a chance to talk about it with uh, with Brewer and Glenn around uh, Chan, Chan Zuckerberg and uh, CTTL in, in Maryland, where they were, it was really Chan Zuckerberg setting up the the whole child movement. I think increasingly the the the, the whole teacher movement, uh, arguably the whole the whole parent movement too, is, is something uh, that maybe uh, the the third uh, third leg in the stool. But, uh, but I think there'll be an increased awareness, perhaps as education 2020 starts to take off, that, uh, that we really need to provide the, the social emotional support for, uh, for really the front lines. And those front lines are our teachers. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I mean, I, I like that as a person who likes teachers. Uh, <laughs> I've talked about the, the teachers in my family, but that's a real thing. And, and teaching has probably always been hard. I think it's harder now. Um, because there's there's so much that's not about the sort of academic instruction, but around classroom management and the the whole child. Um, I, I hope that you're right. I, I, that's uh, early vote for things I would like to see happen. Yeah, I think uh, piling on top, maybe not the right phrase, but compassion fatigue is something we've talked about here on the show before. And I think that goes a long way here, where you have teachers who are dealing with the whole child and dealing with a lot of the the problems kids bring to school because they're not necessarily getting them at home. Uh, compassion fatigue is a real thing. You hear about it from EMS and firefighters and police. I think teachers, as you, I, I think Mike, you just said the front line, yep. maybe Brandon, you said the front line. I think that's a great point and something that this year we'll, we'll need to see. Maybe not even something we, we will see, but we need to see more of it this year, more caring about the whole teacher, professional development, social emotional development, more. I, I, I agree. I like that one a lot. Brandon, uh, you're up for your, your second prediction here. All right. Second prediction for 2019 is Fortnite Fallout. Ooh. So Fortnite uh, launched in September of 2017. It is um, among the more popular games of all time. Uh, it's making $1.5 million of profit a day um, and has uh, sort of transcended gaming to get into, um, you know, being sort of getting into the social space, right? So there are uh, musicians and actors who are, you know, using Fortnite as a platform. There's dance moves that have come out of Fortnite into uh, the real world and vice versa. Um, I just don't think it can go on forever. So I may be, I may be a year early, but when you think about these, you know, this kind of um, uh, incredible success that it's enjoyed, I think it is, uh, I think it's going to be, it, it will eventually give way to something else. And mm -hmm. so um, I, I think that there's also sort of buckled up into Fortnite Fallout is all of the concerns around screen time, all the concerns um, and sort of the, the counter trends that will, uh, that are moving against this, um, how parents talk to their children about, you know, screen time and about something like Fortnite uh, also interesting, with, even within the construct of the game Fortnite, so it launched Fortnite Creative in December of 2018. So more of a focus on, you know, building your own map and inviting friends to collaborate with you there and to play uh, different games within the construct of the, using the same game engine, but within the construct of, um, of a creative uh, application. So either or both, either kids are going to go on to something else, which is one version of Fortnite Fallout, uh, or um, there's going to have to be a way that we address kids these days and what they're, how they're spending their time. I think that's going to happen. I, my, my, my guess is that it happens in 2019. So Fortnite Fallout in 2019. If it's not 2019, check back with me. I'll be talking about it next year. What do you think replaces it, Brent? Like, do you have a sense of, is it just another game that is, um, what is it called, infinite gaming where the map is open and you can game for as long as you want? Or do you think there's a, a, a different movement here that might come along and usurp it in some way? Yeah, so I, I, my, again, sort of cynical hat, I would say it's probably just another game. Like people, we've talked about zone of proximal development, you know, sort of learning is hard. Th building new skills is hard. It's actually hard in Fortnite as well. Um, as someone who has played Fortnite and lost uh, many, you know, famous. Uh, you don't just hide. I just hide the entire time and try no, to. I, no, I don't. You can't hide. Uh, I've, I've lost to many a 12 year old, I'm sure. But um, uh, um, that's, my, that's my cynical take. I, I think, though, if you sort of apply, apply kid solving, uh, to this, I think at some point 
more kids are going to want something less purely confectionery. So I think that the, like when you think about Minecraft or, or something where that is also was, was similarly popular, although not to the level that, that Fortnite is, um, that was more creative. And, you know, you could spend mindless hours in it, obviously. And I think that a lot of, lots of children did. But I think something like this Fortnite creative where the emphasis is less on this one game mode and more on a creative expression and inviting your friends to see that. I think that's a little bit of a pivot, actually. I think that, that k- kids are actually pretty demanding consumers uh, and pretty savvy. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, I mean, I'm not sure that, you know, it's going to be replaced by, um, you know, Shakespeare night. Like, I don't, I, I don't think it's going to be that all of a sudden the, you know, the sweets are abandoned for the Brussels sprouts entirely. But I think something that's going to be, that's going to satisfy children who are, you know, super capable young learners um, and influencers, something that's going to satisfy them more long-term than just the, I'll use the word again, just the confectionery experience of Fortnite. Mm. I like the Fortnite creative angle uh, reminds me a little bit of Minecraft too. Like, so like opening up to more the platform aspect, which is kind of like the, the the one way they may be able to maintain some sustainability but um but i think you're right like the new will always have more appeal than uh something that oh man i did that a year ago or oh man that's so 2017 uh you know it's ultimately going to get uh tossed onto the junk heap of uh of history the the hype cycle is relentless and it 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 uh it fears no trend it is never ceasing. I think of HQ trivia, how I play that every night and I haven't picked that up in, in months now. And we talked about it on a show last year and still going strong, but just hasn't uh, had the same appeal to me. Uh, to Brandon's point, I think Fortnite will go through a similar uh, trough uh, in the near future. It's, uh, Mike, it's stuck around before, Mike, you get to, to your second. Like it, it has had persistence that is longer than I would have expected. Yep. Like if you think about Pokemon Go, which was in its – uh, its peak was as high as Fortnite's, actually. Yep. yep. Um, but it was much narrow, much shorter, that it, peak. I mean, it, it was... It Pokemon went pretty fast. Yeah, it was Pokemon. <laughs> um, yeah, it was... Uh, I mean, was it, a, was it three weeks? Yeah. Was it, uh, it... It certainly wasn't 20 months or however long it's been since the launch of, of Fortnite Battle Royale. I, I, I think it's... Uh, that, that's impressive, to me, actually, mm-hmm. I don't think it's sustainable. So maybe really what I'm predicting is um, the relentless effect of the hype cycle on yet another uh, topic. But um, I, I think there's a, co- there's a couple interesting ways this one could go. Absolutely. And uh, you've seen uh, Fortnite, the creators be also litigated by some of those dance moves you've heard about. So there are other uh, factors that could play into that as we move forward, uh, though amazing stat of 1.5 million a day in earnings uh, for Fortnite. Uh, Mike, bring us home. What's your uh, final prediction here? Uh, looking towards 2019 in education and learning. Yeah. So uh, just real quick uh, with honorable mention, didn't quite make the cut. Uh, I did want to give some lip service to to learning pods just in general. So like podcasts as uh, an audio, as a really uh, burgeoning capability that I think is going to be unlocked for learning use cases increasingly. So uh, that was an also ran, didn't quite make the cut. Uh, the one that I did want to add uh, this year is really building on uh, Sabre Learning from last year, but Sabre Learning, uh, which was sort of leveraging the quantified self uh, and uh, sensors and all those kinds of things for learning contexts as a a prediction, maybe a hope uh, that I had a year ago. I don't know if it actually uh, took hold, but I definitely thought it was, um, it's something that's that's really ripe uh, to occur. I think that uh, specifically as it relates to mindfulness uh, is something that that I do want to at least be on the lookout for this year. Uh, really in part, uh, you know, in response to the Fortnite, uh, Fortniteification of, uh, of the world around us, uh, the overstimulation and sort of the seeking out those quiet times, quiet places. Um, I personally would seek out the right app to monitor my own performance. Uh, since uh, my iPhone has started to track my screen time, I'm starting to, you know, manage myself, wean myself off some of that stuff. I think there will be an increasing movement uh, around um, leveraging apps and monitoring and the quantified self uh, to help us 
really in some ways get off the grid and get off uh, really our, our, our over uh, indulgence to a certain extent in, in the digital. Um, not exactly sure how to play forward. I, I think we are looking to do a, a mindfulness show uh, in the next, uh, next few weeks or months, but, um, but I think that trend is for real. And uh, I think increasingly there'll be better ways to do, almost do biofeedback on yourself. Uh, same thing around your own sleep patterns, like when do I learn best? Something we've talked about a little bit on the show, but uh, definitely want to be on the lookout for uh, whatever might emerge in that space because I think there's a real problem uh, to be solved there. I like that one a lot. We talked a bit about it on the CES show. Um, I, uh, an anecdotal note, we uh, upgraded my wife's phone and got her the Apple Watch recently, and it has a meditation app on there that she's already started using and, and really appreciates it. And it's interesting, you've said many times over, Mike, uh, technology enabled ra- rather than technology driven. And it's interesting to, to think of technology helping to enable getting away from technology, right? right. So using the apps here to, to drive you away from them. Uh, but I've been more mindful. We've also been more mindful of our kids, making sure an hour before bed, we're getting them off screen time. Uh, so we're, we're moving in that direction too. So I think uh, we'll, we'll see a lot of that here in, in 2019. Any, any final thoughts, Brandon and or Mike, uh, thoughts about each other's predictions, thoughts about uh, maybe honorable mentions, as Mike said. Brandon, uh, you first, anything that you want to leave our listeners with here on our prediction show? Yeah, I, I like the two that are mine, but I like uh, just as well the three that weren't. I think uh, I think they're all good um, and and hopeful. I mean, I, I, I think, uh, you know, Dandy years, there's, you know, sustainability of those small schools. They provide a real value in those communities, um, you know, and if they were not sustainable, I think that would be uh, a net detriment. Um, and I, I like both the whole teacher and, um, and mindfulness. Um, I, is there a, was there a pithy mindfulness? I think I had mindful learning. Mindful learning. Got it. Yeah. I think that that one is, is good. I think, um, I think they're all good. As I said, I, I think just a note on that one, the, the purposefulness tied to mindfulness to me, I think is, I mean, maybe I'm saying maybe those are the same thing, but you know, it's just being thoughtful about yourself and how you engage with the world. I'm, I hope that that is something that we all continue to do because I think that mindlessness uh, and mindless learning or non-learning is a lot of what gets us into trouble, actually. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I, I like all that. Uh, great stuff. We'll track these throughout the year. We will come back to them and revisit them and make sure we are keeping you all up to date on where we see them popping up and what trends we're tracking as the year goes on. Obviously things change and uh, media trends and teacher trends will all be part of the show moving forward. As we discuss a lot of different topics, we're back every Tuesday discussing trends in education, trends in learning and trends across multiple adjacencies. So you want to stick with us. Uh, you want to subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, tune in wherever you listen to podcasts. Find us on podbean.com directly, uh, trending in ed on Twitter, trending in ed on Facebook, and trending in education.com. Thanks so much for listening. We want to hear your predictions. Shoot them to us uh, on Facebook or on Twitter. We'll share them here on the podcast and on our social media sites as well. With that said, thanks so much for listening to Trending in Education. <laughs>